So I want to officially welcome everyone onto the call again. And I'll just uh, briefly introduce Susan before turning the mic over to her. Um, so I've been doing kind of criminal justice reform prison work for a long time. And I had the privilege of meeting Susan back when I must have been like 19 or 20 years old. Um, so that was quite we were a, young. a long time ago. We were both young, yeah. Um, and have had the honor of getting to know her better and better um, since that time. And a few years ago, I think this was maybe, oh wow, maybe this was even like seven years ago now, um, Chris and I, who's also on the call, who's also a member of the East Point Peace Academy, got a chance to travel down to Los Angeles and do some work with her and facilitate a workshop for her and, and some members of her community. And I just remember we, we spent a, a day with Susan after the workshop and she showed us around to some of her homes and, and spent some time in the car with her. And I just remember, remember being in the car with her and she was just constantly being hit up with like phone call after phone call after phone call from people who need her support or people who she's working with in some way. Um, and it just made it very obvious how central of a figure she is in the community as we lost her again. Hopefully we'll be able to figure that out. Oh, no, we're still there. Hmm. We'll continue to, to I, one of the things that I've realized with these Zoom calls is that it's definitely not perfect. Uh, so we'll deal with the tech challenges as we, as we get them. Um, but yeah, I was, I was sharing that it, it's so obvious when you spend a day in Los Angeles with Susan, how central of a figure she is and how many people uh, she directly supports. Uh, and then Chris and I got an opportunity to see some of her homes um, and some of the resources that she's providing to formerly incarcerated women in the Los Angeles area. And it's just mind blowing the, the, the work and the network that she's been able to put together um, and many of you may know that she was a finalist for the CNN Heroes Award a few years ago. She's also the author of a book called Becoming Miss Burton uh, and is an incredible leader and an asset and one of the, the real important leaders in the national movement of formerly incarcerated people. So we're really honored to, to have her here today uh, and to hear a little bit about her story. So with that, I'll uh, hand it over to you, Susan. And uh, yeah, really honored to have you here. Thank you, and thank everybody for their patience here. Uh, trying to get through this new normal is, it, it is challenging. But my name is Susan Burton. I'm the founder of a New Way of Life Reentry Project. And a New Way of Life uh, started uh, in my home in 1998, following my own incarceration. What happened for me uh, to become incarcerated is just tragic. And it's, and it's not just my tragic, it's so many people's tragic um, experience with our criminal justice system, experience with lack of uh, tolerance, intolerance, uh, no compassion, no empathy, and just this, this race to incarcerate. Um, so my, my five-year-old son was killed by an LAPD detective. And I want to tell you, every time uh, uh, a man or a woman uh, or somebody's killed by the, the, the police, you know, this sorrow wakens up in me. I did a lot of work uh, to heal, but still this sorrow just comes up. So my son died, uh, he was killed by accident, the policeman ran him over, and I, I began to drink, and I began to drink, and I drink to drown the grief, and that drinking escalated to drug use. I mean, everybody remembers the 80s uh, and the uh, crack cocaine epidemic, or the crack cocaine attack on uh, communities across the nation, and my community was one of those communities, and I fell prey and victim to using uh, cocaine in all its forms, and for that I was incarcerated. And I was incarcerated over and over and over again, and when I asked the courts for help, all they did was cuff me up and send me way down the road to a prison. And that whole happened to me six times. And I found help in an affluent community in Santa Monica. And there in Santa Monica, 
I found people with compassion, with empathy. I found uh, skilled recovery services. And today I'm 22 years sober. Um, and But from that experience in Santa Monica, I just thought, why isn't something like this in South LA? Uh, so many women were coming home from prison. So many women felt prey and victim to the same uh, uh, environment and circumstances that led them back to prison. And so many people just like me went back to prison. So I worked, saved my money, got a little house, and I started a new way of life reentry project. And now a new way of life uh, actually consists of nine homes. And I work tirelessly because I love what I do. I, uh, it's work, but it's also a life calling. It's work, but I feel like part of it is what I act that's been stolen from me, that's been taken and lifted from me. And I get to see other women come to a new way of life and, you know, recover. Um, so we've helped over uh, 1,100 women um, come out of prison and get their lives back together. Uh, I've had the opportunity to, to reunite 300 women uh, with their children. And, you know, I don't have my child. I don't have KK. Uh, I do have a daughter. Um, but um, that was my son's name, KK. Uh, I don't have KK, I don't have Marquet, but I, I do have, um, uh, I have, I have, I've had the honor and the privilege of playing with like 300 little kids coming through these doors and, and I look at them and they look at me with such, um, gratitude because they kind of know I was part of the key of them getting back with their mom. So, um, when COVID-19 hit, uh, and all of the sheriffs and the governor and the legislature and the sheriffs, all, all these people were saying that, that uh, they couldn't release people because there was, they couldn't release them to the streets during COVID-19. So I just thought that, you know, what we could do at A New Way of Life was to open up another house. And, uh, and expand our capacity to uh, receive women back. So it was like, we made the decision one day and 10 days later, the house was up operating and residents were walking through the doors. And some of those residents, you'll get the opportunity to talk to in a few minutes. But, you know, I just want to um, say that I'm just extremely, extremely grateful um, to be doing what I do. You know, I'm grateful for the moment. It looks like change is happening. But I think King thought change was happening too. Um, and it shifted. But I'm, 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 I'm in such an admiring and, and inspired by the young people rolling out and consistently showing up in the thousands and the thousands and see this um, worldwide movement to um, end racism. So, you know, uh, for me, hope is alive. Um, for me, it's kind of strange because I've operated from a place of being uh, affected by racism. I don't know what it be, would feel like not to be affected by racism. Um, pretty frequently. So, um, you know, that's who I am. That's what I do. And I'm going to actually um, uh, pass the, the, the call to Lexis. Uh, Lexis is a resident at A New Way of Life. Uh, she's been here since May 8th. She was released during the uh, pandemic and uh, during, during COVID-19. And I'm going to uh, let her share a while with you about herself. 
this is her first Zoom call. This is her first time speaking. So, um, but I know she can, she can, she can, I know she can do it. All right. Hi, I'm Rachel. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. All right. Um, me getting released during this COVID-19 um, was different, but I don't know. I feel like I'm okay with it because it's not, it's not prison. But um, it's easy. We can see our family sometimes, but we have to be our like our little six feet apart. Um, I don't know. So we're we're social. Yeah, we're socially distancing here <laughs> at the new way of life, and and when the um when the they they begin to say shelter in place, we um sort of. You know, nobody, nobody's running around, nobody's going to work. Everyone is in the homes and they're safe. But I know after being away for periods of time, people long to see their family. So we've made space and room for them to uh, come and visit. But, you know, uh, um, Alexis, you shared with me about, a little bit about how you uh, ended up incarcerated and what it felt like and how your life's been. And, how you see your life now. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that um, if you're okay with that. Um, well, I ended up in prison because at the age of 11, my mother ended up passing away. And so I was basically forced into to foster care, but I didn't want to be there. So I ended up starting to run away and one day I ended up finding this guy and he basically trafficked me. And so I was trafficked all the way up until the age of 19 when I caught this case. Um, I was incarcerated eight years for um, human trafficking. Um, I was a baby myself, but the lady that I was with, in the, um, the lady was a minor too. Um, so the court system basically threw me to the wolves, I should say, and I ended up in prison for eight years. And now that you're home? And now that I'm home, now that I'm home I see life differently, but it did take 80 steps. It did take eight years. It took eight years. Um, to me, I feel like now where I'm standing and where I'm standing in faith, where I'm standing in my peace, this is an opportunity for me to open up and finally allow people to hear my story and allow people to understand where I came from and what I've been through. So um, I can open up and um, finish schooling because in prison I was going to school for um, an associate's degree in communications because I want to be a human trafficking counselor. So I'm in the process of finishing that. Um, I want to be a motivational speaker after I get over my shyness. Um, but I feel like my story can help a lot of girls that's been through that lifestyle and that's still going through that lifestyle. Um, and I just want them to know like there is hope out there. Like when we don't know um, being in prison when we don't know that, you know, people are out there praying for us, they're marching for us, they're protesting for us, they're writing for us, or whatever they're doing, like, they're doing it, and just don't give up hope, especially when you're in a situation. Um, don't never give up hope. All right. Thank you, Lexus. You're welcome. And then I know that there'll be a time that you can pose questions uh, if you'd like to. So we also have Ms. Reed here with us, and um, I'm going to give her the phone. Uh, Eleanor Reed, I did time with her uh, back in the day, so, and she's just now coming home, and I've been with A New Way of Life for over 20 years, so that just speaks to the length of time that she has been incarcerated. Uh, 
And uh, I am so, so happy uh, because I advocate so, and I write letters and I send messages and I write the board of prison terms and I go take, make visits to the board of prison terms and what have you. And then when somebody gets home, we just have a celebration. So here's Miss Reed. We got a few more minutes. Hi, I'm Eleanor Lee, and um, and um, I want to um, talk about the time that I was uh, in prison um, when the COVID nineteen broke out. They only load. Excuse me, I'm kind of nervous. They only um, let us know in it broke out like in December. But we didn't find out anything about it until like February. So, and where I worked at, you know, they didn't allow us to have no masks or no gloves when they had people that came in with the symptoms, you know, and our families had to make a big stink, you know, about us getting masks and gloves. Um, then, um, the company that I worked for, then they started allowing us to have the Kyvex too, so that we could go and terminalize those rooms at the uh, patients that had symptoms. Um, I've been down for 35 years. And how I felt about that, when I wasn't allowed to have masks or either gloves, I didn't want to go do any kind of cleaning for nobody, you know, because I might catch it, you know, just being, you know, in there if these people were sick. So now that I'm free, I've been down like this set for 35 years and I am so grateful because I never thought I would see the outside again. Um, so coming to a new way of life, it is helping me um, to better myself to get better skills. Um, New Way of Life had um, showed me love that when we went out to go protest other the other ladies and men that were still locked up, I felt so good doing that because I know they did it for me, you know, and I'm very grateful, very, you know, um, the 35 years that I did, you know, I... Um, did hurt somebody very bad, very brutally. And I have, I'm very sad that I um, did that. And that's something that I would never do again. Using drugs, alcohol, it's not in my, uh, my plan. My plan is to get my associate degree and I don't know if I'll be able to work, but I'm going to do my best. Um, oh, it was just exciting when I walked out of that prison to see, I wanted to kiss the ground, <laughs> but came here, first thing I wanted was something to eat and smoke a cigarette, which I know is bad for my health. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, make a long story short. Um, when I got here to New Web Life, walking up the stairs, having my own bedroom, which I have a roommate, but it's totally different. I could see the airplanes, I could go outside. I don't have to worry about, you know, bumping into no one or people looking at you crazy. Um, being tested. Negative. <laughs> um, I know being here is going to help me become a better person. Um, getting more knowledge, getting more uh, my education. I'm getting ready to do uh, a computer class. So to better my computer skills. Um, I feel very bad, very remorseful for what I did. Um, 
I really don't even know what else to say. So maybe right. when you guys have questions, then and I could uh, be more better to answer those questions for you guys. All right. So, and I'm just grateful to be on Zoom. This, I'm shy. This is my first time. So just kind of bear with me. Yeah. So, you know, um, we in a in a moment, a moment in time now that seems like there's never been a moment like this before uh, for me. I remember the civil rights move, movement, uh, but this seemed like way more than that movement. Um, I was just a little girl when when the civil rights movement was happening. And um, I really believe that there should be a, a greater and bigger investment in what you know really makes our community safe. And from one of the things I know makes community safe is for people to have housing and hope for the future. And um, many places throughout our community, uh, I mean, we have a homeless crisis uh, epidemic, and then you know people just don't have hope for the future. So I thought about what I could do around um, uh, making space and a place for people to come home from prison, not just a new way of life, but a broader uh, reentry type of movement, a broader reentry network. And so a year, a couple of years ago, I began to train people to replicate our model. And our model is grounded of the in the principles of dignity and respect, uh, in the uh, 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 in the principle of every life has potential, and that it's our responsibility to help people to find and develop their own potential and support them in finding what that is, and not dictating them what to what it should be. And so we have actually started what we call SAFE, and SAFE stands for Sisterhood Alliance for Freedom and Equality, and it's a network of houses around the country uh, that uh, is uh, replicating um, the model that we created here at A New Way of Life. Um, so, um, you know, that's what I uh have been doing the last couple of years really focusing on and I, I you know i think it's beautiful but if we're gonna ever decarcerate if we're gonna we're gonna have to have places for those men and women to return to you know and i guess i'm thinking that i know that our government should be uh um putting more money into this type of uh infrastructure but 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 they're not. So um, you know, I'm trying to do all that I can, every way that I can, to build that infrastructure out. I mean, Lexus could be running a house for girls that have been trafficked and help them recover and help them get on the right path. And I mean, we all through through my experience, I opened a new way of life and. There are so many formerly incarcerated people around the country that want to do some good things and just a, a little investment of time and resources, you know, will will prompt them on their way. But I believe that, you know, we're going to have to uh, 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 build a, a reentry infrastructure. And that's not just, that's nationally or even internationally, because we have a incarceration crisis all around the all around the country so we have play, we have our homes in eight states thus far we're about to uh next month create uh bring six more states into the network and uh we have a uh, one country uganda and I've, i'm corresponding with nigeria now they want to create a safe house there so um you know that's 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 my hope for the future as this movement continues to push. I'm sure decarceration is a part of that and we have to uh, shift resources out of that 
type of structures and back into our community. Uh, many of you know that at the East Point Peace Academy, uh, we are an organization that's run entirely on the gift economy. And what that means is that in our six years or seven years of programming, we've had hundreds of workshops and have had thousands of people come through our events. And we have never charged a single dime to anyone that has attended any of our programs. And that's our ongoing commitment to ensure that our programs are accessible as possible. We never charge anybody a fee. And the gift economy is a lot more than just not charging people to attend our workshops. And we're guided by these seven principles. And we're not gonna go through all of the principles, um, but just wanted to name that the sixth principle of financial transparency is something that's really important to us. Um, last year, we spent about $119,000 in all of our programs, and that means running programs in multiple prisons where we have teams of incarcerated people who go through like a months long process to become certified as trainers with our organization, and they lead trainings in nonviolence and restorative justice for other incarcerated people. Uh, we lead trainings all throughout the country in nonviolence and organizing. And coming into this year, uh, not only are we losing a main source of income because of COVID, because we can't do the workshops that we typically do, um, but we've lost several of our biggest funders coming into this year. So we really do need to rely on our community for support. And this is what our community is. Uh, at the East Point Peace Academy, about uh, half, maybe a little over half of the work that we do is with incarcerated communities, working directly to empower them, uh, as well as doing a lot of movement building trainings on the outside. And we offer all of our programs without a fee associated with it, with an invitation to everyone who attends to help support our work if you are able to, and if it makes you happy to support our work. There's a beautiful quote that says, when giving is done out of pure joy, you can't tell who the giver is and who the recipient is. So who's getting more joy out of this interaction, the little boy or the duck? And that's kind of what we want you to think about. Like, would it make you happy to support our work and to support the work of Susan and Eleanor and Alexis, knowing the type of work that you'll be supporting? Uh, we'll send this, in, we'll put this into the chat box and send it in a, in a follow-up email as well. But if you go to eastpointpeace.org backslash Susan donate, any donation that you give through that particular link will be shared with the work of a new way of life so that Susan's work will be sustained and that we'll be able to support Eleanor and Lexus as well. Um, so anyone can go to our website and click on, uh, yeah, just go to eastpointpeace.com, or I'm sorry, .org that should be. Um, we need to fix that. So it's eastpointpeace.org backslash Susan donate, um, or you can go to PayPal or Facebook and donate through that as well. And we'll make sure all of those gifts are shared with Susan. Uh, all right, everyone, welcome back from your small groups. Hope you got to chat with some new friends. Um, so we'll open it up to questions and um, if you'd like. Oh, thank you so much and thank you all for having this happen Thanks for being here my my heart is open to you and i'd love to hear from you about forgiveness i need to learn about forgiveness and i i i gather that all three of you have forgiven um deeply forgiven or working in forgiving please talk to us about forgiveness so for me uh the walking and holding the rage and the pain and the anger was almost like a poison and it was tearing me um, um to, it, it it was it was it was corrupting me from being able to be free and until I learned to forgive, I couldn't get free. I couldn't access my personal agency and power. Um, and I know that um, blame and uh, judgment and 
uh, all of these things that I've learned uh, in the world, these, these types of ways of making myself, sometimes I could think that those, those types of uh, ways of being, feeling and thinking almost tried to make me feel like I was maybe above or better. So, you know, I had to forgive the policeman that uh, killed my son. I had to begin the men, uh, forgive the men that harmed me. I had to forgive all of the places that I wanted to um, take blame. And that allowed me to take ownership over my life and my direction. No one else had the power because I wasn't looking for them to get back or, or what have you. So. So, so I, I forgave and by forgiving, I, I got free and I began to have agency and, you know, it seems like life began to have meaning and purpose much bigger than me. So that was my work with forgiveness. And, you know, I, I talked about every time a man is, is killed, I feel this sorrow. Uh, and, and, and I do, but sorrow is not uh, uh, the, the unforgiven the loss of, of, of life I connect with today, so uh, I have to forgive myself in order for me to heal before I could um, to forgive the crime that I committed to help me heal not to maybe he asked the family for their forgiveness. I asked God to put it on their hearts. You know, and then I, I forgave it myself. Um, yeah, and, and I too, you know, I, I, I forget, I had to do some work around forgiving myself for, you know, all the harms that I caused myself and others. Um, and that, that, I think that was the hardest one, forgiving me. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I have some, I have some freedom there too. I'm a hard cr critic of myself, <laughs> but I have some freedom there. And the other part of my forgiveness is my family. You know, uh, um, not just asking them for their forgiveness, but I have to forgive myself for harming them. You know, not physically, but mentally, because I'm not, I wasn't there. Uh, my children, same thing. Um, I had to get that forgiveness, accent to forgive me. Um, when my sons were younger, I wrote them letters about me um, leaving them for so long. And I have one son living I lost two. So, and I'm still going through that process of getting the forgiveness of my son. Like I said, I forgive myself, but just not just me, anybody, you know, the, the police department, everybody that had something to do with me committing my crime, the whole community, I needed their forgiveness. Even though I, they don't have to do it to me personally, but I know somewhere in their heart, I ask God to put it in their hearts. You know, the MTA, the fire department, whoever was involved, you know, um, that's to get forgiveness for what I did. Um, the only thing I want to add is um, forgiveness. It's not about forgiving the other person or the other person forgiving you. It's about you having to learn how to forgive yourself and the things that you've done and the things that you're going to go through. Um, it's just to better yourself and your strength and your faith to keep pushing forward and knowing that you're worth it and you have the strength to keep pushing forward. Um, I'd like to ask all three of you a question as well because um, you know, I know for Lexus and Eleanor, you went to a new way of life um, straight from prison. But I, I know, you know, like obviously there's uh, companies like Geo Group, which used to be Wacken Hut, which runs private prisons, also runs transitional homes now. And, it, and for them, it's a money-making thing. 
And I know for a new way of life, you're not only are you not that, but you're so much more than just like a service agency. You do so much around policy and healing and empowerment. And I'm just wondering if I could hear from the three of you, like what makes a new way of life different than just some uh, service agency? So, Lexus. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I want to ask you. So, Lexus actually didn't come straight from um, from prison. Mm -hmm. um, somehow, the counselor didn't give her the information we had asked the counselor to give her, and she ended up somewhere else. So maybe you can talk about that somewhere else that you ended up that we came and picked you up from when you called it. Um, well, I didn't know that my counselor, um, well, I had a counselor and then she left and then they gave me another counselor. And I didn't know that the counselor was communicating with April the whole time. And so the day that I got released, um, I didn't know anybody was there that was supposed to be there to pick me up or anything. So um, I ended up calling my sister to come pick me up from the Greyhound station. And so from there, they ended up, my, my parole officer ended up making me go to a shelter. And um, the shelter is ran, I guess, by Geo. And um, a little bit because they're they're more stricter um it's more stricter is more ha not hands-on but it's more of you got to go here and you got to do this and you got to do this and you got to do this whereas a new way of life um a new way life shows you okay you have to get your social security you have to get your id you have to get the things that you get but everything else is optional you you know, um, it really was you an independent in an independency um, where you can be your own person and you can go and, you know, find you a job that you like. Um, they don't force you to to pick a they don't force you to go through a job that you don't want. Um, Staley, they really help you out with the aspects of um, coming out of prison and Finding and being who you are and who you want to be, and they allow you to follow your dreams. Um, so I think that's the geo and a new way of life. Yeah, hi everybody, and thank you so much for coming and sharing your stories. This has been really um, enlightening, and I've really felt grateful getting to witness and hear um, all of not only your experiences, but the tremendous work that I have heard and what you just talked about with forgiveness, what you talked about with your relationships with your families, all of that internal work on top of the external work, coming out of prison, living your life in the society that doesn't have that infrastructure that Susan was talking about earlier. So my question is, Susan, if there are a few next steps for what you, like your vision, I can hear in your voice that you have got this vision, right? I wanna hear a little bit more about what are those next steps on the logistical front um, that you see making a difference given where we are in our society right now and for a new way of life. Um, I think the logistical steps is around um, uh, training and learning the um, uh, states where the safe houses are and uh, beginning to build out advocacy and uh, uh, um, approaches to um, decarcerating those states and multiplying whatever agency is in that state to be able to receive more, 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 um, more people and resources. But I think it's really around uh, building out a strategy for decarceration in the states and finding out who the players are and um and 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 addressing you know um the expansion of the safe houses and uh 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 the reallocation of resources um and building building space for people to come home in their community safe safely 
you know, and, you know, and along with raising raising resources to be able to um, uh, support, you know, support the be the 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 actual setup of the safe home. So we help people to set the safe homes up. We resource them for that, and then we um, I have a development person that helps them to raise money and so forth. But you know. Uh, uh, tightening up that infrastructure to do all of what we need to do. So, yeah. Thank you. And Amelia, another resource for that uh, question on kind of the, the larger vision that Susan, <coughs> excuse me, that Susan has as well is uh, a radio documentary that Chris from East Point Peace Academy, who's on this call, put together a while ago. He put together a, like a series of radio documentaries called the Bringing Down a New Jim Crow. And there's a specific episode that features uh, the voices of Susan Burton, as well as some more residents of uh, A New Way of Life and Michelle Alexander, who's the author of A New Way of Life, I'm not sorry, of A New Jim Crow. Um, so I will put the link to that particular episode into the chat and we'll also email it to everyone as an additional resource as well. So uh, the question is, how can community members, either those with lived experiences or those wanting to support, get involved in your work beyond just supporting you financially? And also what is a typical day at a new way of life like? Um, how many homes are there? Some more practical things like that. So there are nine homes uh, and um, uh, a typical day is we wake up in the morning, at eight o'clock do no morning meditation. We go about our day getting, you know, in this home particularly, everyone is pretty new. So we're getting IDs, we're getting um, uh, connected to medical, we're getting social security, we're registering in school, um, just going around being busy, doing the re-entry. Uh, you know, um, uh, I don't know if you want to answer that part of it, Eleanor. Yeah, you know, what is a typical day like? A typical day, um, like Susan said, is getting up in the morning, shower, meditation, breakfast, and then um, we go, like we have a, um, a housing coordinator will come pick us up and we'll go get our social security um, benefits um, filled out. We'll go to DMV, like I went today, to go get my ID. Um, so that's a typical day we come back. We have dinner. Uh, we. The women in the house, we get together and we have like a little meeting or, you know, how our day was. Um, if there's something else that we can add on to it that uh, something needs to be done or something that one of us missed. Did you register in school? Uh, yes, so I registered in school today for a computer class to a refresher course on my computer skills. Um, what else? You go for walks, you go shopping. Oh, yes. You go shopping. I uh, go for maybe a 20 minute walk. Um, I went shopping yesterday. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of things. That's a lot of things that we do. I have a tomato garden and I go water my little tomato garden statue. <laughs> okay. so, so, one of the things is that, you know, um, there's no, I mean, eight o'clock meditation is standard, it's stationary. That's how we start our day on a positive note to get everybody together. But everybody has their own thing. None of us, you know, we don't, Every everyone has their own individualized sort of goals and, and plans and, and dreams and, and we support that. Um, so there's no cookie cutter typical day for everybody uh, outside of morning meditation. And then when, we, we, you know, they're, they are attending Zoom meetings, they're, you know, participating in different ways like that. But yeah. Uh, and um, people can get involved in a, a number of ways. I mean, on our website, a newwayoflife.org under safe, um, you can, you know, you can register to be trained to start a home in your area. Uh, that's one of the requirements is to go through the training in order to be able to get support to start a home. Um, you know, you can, um, uh, people uh, sometimes do classes and um, um, now that we're going all virtual, 
uh, people are are doing different types of classes, literacy classes, uh, not literacy. I'm I'm sorry, financial classes, um, but uh, uh, meditation classes. You know, a, a, a variety of things. So uh, there's all types of ways. If there's a a skill set you want to share with us, you can go to info at a new way of life and um, hit the, the uh, volunteer and, and fill out that, that form and we'll get back to you. Uh, but so, so there's, you know, a variety of things. We'll get to a question from Coney says, how do people get connected with a new way of life? Do you have teams who go and pick up people at the gate upon release? What do you do when you reach full capacity? Where else do you send people? So yeah, depending on what, what prison people are getting released from, we will pick you up from the gate. Uh, if it's all the way in Northern California, usually, sometimes they have um, these, um, what do they call the religious people that come in? Uh, they have these teams, a, a Christian group will pick up people and bring them down to LA or they'll get on the Greyhound or the train and we'll pick them up from the train station. And uh, when we don't have, when we're at capacity, we'll go and uh, we have a network. So I have two uh, places in LA County that actually have been trained to replicate. I mean, one in LA County, one in Riverside County. And so I know a lot of people, uh, if someone come home, and they're looking for a bed. We have to. We have to find them a bed. I've even had occasion a few years back that I I brought a woman home, and uh, she stayed there because she didn't get to the bus off the bus until eight o'clock at night, and she had she she had a walker, and she was a senior, and um, I didn't want to put her in a motel, so I took her home with me for the night, and in the morning, we found we found a place for her. So I think it's probably about time to begin to transition. So I just want to thank you, the three of you in particular, one last time. Susan, I know how busy you are. And for Eleanor and Lexis, with everything that must be going on in your life and all the transitions and things to hear your stories was such an honor. So really, really want to thank you all. Um, I wanted to turn it back to the three of you one last time to see if you have any closing words before I uh, unmute everyone and give everyone an opportunity to say thank you. So, Kazu, I don't know if people know, but it's been almost two decades since we first met. And I was sleeping in the dining room and you were uh, the, uh, running this small foundation called Peace Development Fund. And you made a generous grant to A New Way of Life and you know i didn't know what grants were even i didn't even know how to write a grant i didn't even know how to do a report i did the best that i could and you extended that actually uh was actually lifeblood for us and i just want to acknowledge that and i want to say thank you and it's, it's my honor and privilege to be here with you and you actually you and chris came down to um i think we're out we're out in san bernardino at a retreat site and you facilitated a retreat where we were doing some healing work and some um, sharing to help build the leadership. And I want to thank you and Chris for that too. And then you just did a book. Um, uh, um, what's it called? Organ, what's the, uh, it's healing called. Healing Resistance. Um, healing Resistance, which is an excellent book. Um, and I got the privilege of putting a little blurb in your book. And I just want to say it's, it's my pleasure and honor uh, to be here with you. And Chris wrote a book also, um, and, 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 and I'm, I'm blanking on the name of that book. The Gandhian Iceberg. Uh, Gandhian Iceberg, right, yes. Uh, but it's, it's great um, to be here with you. And I'm so happy to have the women talk and share their story. Um, this, this is leadership in action. Yes, I want to say thank you for uh, allowing me to participate. I really enjoyed it, even though I said I was a little nervous and a little shy, but I hope I answered you guys' questions the best to my ability. So I, I really am grateful that I got a chance to participate. Thank you. Lexus? 
I just want to say thank you for allowing me to share my story and hopefully it touches you guys and you guys go out and tell the world what we're doing over here. So yeah. All right. Yeah, so I'm going to, uh, Astrid is going to go ahead and unmute everyone. So if we all just want to shower uh, Susan, Eleanor, and Lexus with our gratitude, and we will end our call with that. So thank you all for joining us. Astrid? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So inspiring.